contracts. It was one L contracts. The experiment was the curve was a mandatory B minus. It was roughly like a two, two something, whatever it was. He gave the option to give everyone in the class a B minus. No final, nothing. How many of you would take that? No, no. <laughs> everyone, whatever the curve is, everyone gets a B minus. Everybody has to be in. Like, the whole class has to agree. Oh, See. <laughs> well, th <laughs> we'll talk about this later. So, who do you think would oppose that kind of problem? The good students, right. So that's what we call a holdout problem. When we do, when we do eminent domain, we'll talk about this. So there's something called takings that you've probably heard about where, you know, say there's a block of property and the government wants to take the property. The guy in the corner says okay, the guy in this corner says okay, and the guy in the middle says no. And the guy in the middle can drive the price all the way up. He's called a holdout. So this is something called a holdout because you have the A students who won't want to do it, so you have to buy them off. And you figure out ways to get them in the other ways. Uh, and it's we'll, we'll do this a little bit in law and economics later with takings, but uh, it's a very it's kind of a prisoner's dilemma too. I don't know if you ever study that, but uh, you really have competing interests. I would not take that because I, I I was not going for that, but a lot of people really tried hard. So I won't offer that. You all have one final. It's a three-hour exam. It's in class. Open book, open notes, whatever you want. The format I'm still figuring out, but it's probably going to be some sort of essay. I don't like multiple choice. I doubt it's multiple choice. It'll be some sort of essay. But there will be word limits and very strict ones, like really, really strict ones, probably in a few hundreds of words. So you're going to have plenty of time, but you're going to have to be very judicious with how you use your, uh, with how you use your words. Okay. I'll, I'll give you more about that later. And I think the last class, assuming we're on schedule, just be a review session. And I might do a sample question or something like that in the last class. So you'll at least have something. Okay. So let's get started. Um, all right. I don't see any drops, not that you could because there's no other section. See, in the afternoon, I could say that there's like three sections meet at this exact same time. So if like people dropped, I know because of me, you guys are stuck. So unfortunately, there are no drops, which looks good. Uh, I'm passing around the sign-up sheet. Try to do it right this time. Um, just, just try. If, if you can, I have another copy in my office, and I can go run and get it. But I See, that's, that's smart. Now you're thinking like a lawyer. OK. <laughs> Ooh, let's see that. See that? <laughs> see that? That that's vicious. If you want to screw your class, but but if you wipe her name out, I can never call on that person, and that might actually work to their benefit. All right, but that's why I go up and down rows. So whether you're on the chart or not, doesn't really matter. Okay, so let's let's take a look. Um, one thing I just want to make uh, clear: the syllabus of this class is pretty interactive. So this is a syllabus right here, right? At the end of the semester, if you want to see what do we do in a given day, you scroll down to that class, say, okay, class one, August 13th, you click on it. Okay? That takes you to everything we did that day. There'll be a link to the class notes, there'll be a link to the chat, and also there'll be a link to video. And you probably didn't even realize I was doing this, uh, but I actually have a little recorder right here. And um, don't worry, you're not in the video, you can't see yourselves, you can't even hear your voices, it's so muffled. But if you scroll down, you actually will see it's right on YouTube, right there. This little camera right here. So th these will be available after class if you want to rewatch it. A couple people ask me at recording. You can do it also, but it's right up here. This is available for you in real time. Uh, well, it's not, not in real time, but it'll be available right after class. So uh, it won't be a substitute for coming to class, but if you miss it for whatever reason, you can then watch it later. So again, uh, here's today's lesson. Uh, we're doing mechanics of average possession. Packing and uh, chattels and uh, George O'Keefe. Uh, the notes are here. The chat's here. And I think I got it so that you can see both the chat and the notes at the same time. Um, so no more flipping back and forth. Uh, so sorry, no cookies today. And in the right hand, these are our notes for today. And um, we're about to start. Okay. Any questions or anything else administrative in nature? Okay. Um, I don't have any paper, but the our classmate from Kentucky, you have an you have an adverse possession story. I didn't forget. Tell us. Thank you. 
And then I think you said your your mom actually had average possession of a house she lived in for ten years, even though she never had the paperwork for it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Is that how she rolls? Yeah. Wow, that that's pretty impressive. Okay. And uh, I don't know. Does anyone else have any adverse possession stories? No. Yeah. I mean, we've been over No, you you didn't mention that in class on Monday. No. Oh, come on, 15 inches is the exact Actually, it was more like four or five inches when I came down to it. What happened was that our neighbor was selling his house. He wanted to sell the developer who owned the three condos on it. Three condos on it. Uh -huh. And because it's a small space, he used every inch possible. Oh, my God. So their survey said that our fence, part of our garage, and our carport were on their property. Well, our survey said that we were all free and clear. Uh, so we eventually, they paid us to set our driveway, tear down the fence. The survey says <laughs> price is wrong. Okay, so <laughs> happy Gilmore. Uh, there it goes. Okay, so let's. <laughs> yes, you'll you'll cringe because I have too many bad jokes, but you'll you'll cringe at them. Okay, so let's start with uh, okay and Kunto, Kunto. Let's say Kunto. Okay, that that's how we should say it. <laughs> I had too many giggles in the afternoon class, so it's Quinto. <laughs> okay, got that? Yeah. Okay. So, Quinto. Let's look at the, let's look at the, let's look at a map. Uh, if you go to today's uh, uh, the, the post for today, uh, I have some um, I have some maps that might make this a little bit easier. Uh, has anyone ever been to Washington State? Yes. Good. Wow, three people in the other class. I think only one person that. Okay, well, I'll call in the three of you to start. <laughs> <laughs> those, those Texans who never leave the farm, they'll be much better off. So we have this case. We have this case, uh, Howard versus Kunto. Uh, it took place in the Puget Sound in Washington, which is a very, very pretty place. And it's a summer home. Um, I'll walk through the facts because really the history of this is really messed up. The long and short of it is no one actually lives on their right property. All the surveys are off by about 50 feet. So the person who thought they lived here actually lives here, here, lived here, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this all came to a head when one of the neighbors, Howard, had a survey done. And when Howard had a survey done, he realized that he owned this plot, but he also owned this plot, B. On B lived Moyer. Moyer is this other guy who's not too important. But Moyer realized that, hey, I own C. That's where the Kuntos house is. So let's get this straight. Howard owned Moyer's land, and Moyer owned Kuntos land. So Howard and Moyer had this idea, let's swap uh, properties. So Howard swapped with Moyer. Moyer got B, and then Howard got title to C. Now C is disputed. On C is Kuntos house. Kunta owns D, where there's nothing there. It's irrelevant. So Kunta owns a plot of land that doesn't have his house on it. That's a problem. So the problem and what's disputed is C. Kunto has been living on it for about a year, although his predecessors and interests have been there for decades, whereas uh, Howard has just purchased it. And this brings us to the present. Um, the trial court ruled in favor of Howard. Okay, why did the trial court rule in favor of Howard? My friends who went to Washington. Oh, I'll go. Yes. Not right there. Did you raise your hand? Yes. Uh, uh, yeah, because uh, they never the the land was not passed on to everybody. He was passed on to the land that they were. Uh, the land that they were on was the fact that the deed all was entirely separate. So they said that um, the 
know when we were talking on was if it was let, let's take a, let's take a step back. There's a much simpler answer. So this is this nice house by the water in the Puget Sound. Um, were the Kunzos there year round? Were their were their predecessors there year round? No. It, it was a, it was a summer house. So what what are the four elements of average possession we did on Monday? What what was one of them? Continuity. So was there continuity? The trial court said no. Okay, the trial court said it wasn't continuous. They were only there for the summer. Um, you know, we, we watched that video of Mr. Robinson on Monday. I think someone asked, is he allowed to leave? Or is, does he have to stay on the property 24-7? Um, and the answer to the question is no. Of course he doesn't have to stay there 24-7. That, that would be unreasonable to expect. Um, does anyone think that the situation changes when you're there, say, three months out of the year? Say there's a 10-year period for uh, adverse possession, so that's you know roughly uh, 120 months. Say if you're only there three months a year, you're only there for 30 months. So out of 120 months of adverse possession period, you're only there for 30. Does anyone have any problem with that? Is there anything wrong with that? If you get the best use of your land, two thirds of the time, it's not being used at all. So someone's arguing someone else can use it better if they can spend more time on it. Okay. Um, does a house disappear during the winter? I mean, is a house still there? Do you think they're letting the house go into disrepute during the winter? Do you think they're going to have a, a caretaker stop by and check the pipes and stuff? Anyone actually have a summer home? I don't. Uh, no. No, I, I don't have a summer home, but I'd imagine if you're wealthy enough to have a home on the canal in the Puget Sound, you have a caretaker during the summer. So it's not exactly wasting. But let me, let me give a variant of your, of your question. Assume that the exact same facts, but instead of building a summer house, they're campers, and they pitch a tent during the summer, maybe even an RV, but during the rest of the year, it's just vacant. They, they're good stewards, they're Greenpeace members, they go there and they live with nature and they pitch a tent and they, they, they live there peacefully. Does anyone think that changes the situation? I heard someone say yes? Yes? They're not putting the effort or the money into the property. Okay. So they're not putting the effort they don't have property. It's not there. So, so what's the standard the court relies on then? How does a court, def how does a, the court of, uh, court of Appeals of the trial court define continuity in this context? Is it based on purely chronological sequence? Depends on what it's intended. Mm-hmm. Right, exactly. The the test the court looked to, excuse me, is what is the normal use for the uh, for the property. If the nor the property uh, is only used as summer home, then that's all it should be used for. Yes. So it's similar to like the use of the construction standard or the building standard in that situation. How would this summer house normally would apply to like let's say a Lincoln lodge or something? Exactly. Yeah. You look, you look to the how, how this property is being intended to use. If the facts are, are as discussed in the case, everyone in this block used in the exact same fashion. Everyone went there in the winter, I'm sorry, in the summer. That's how everyone used it. And if you view it from the point of notoriety, one of the reasons why we might object to having the, the campers uh, giving them adverse possessions, because during the, during the uh, winter, there's no tents there. No one can see that. The owner won't be on notice that someone's in the property. Here, the house is there year-round. There is notice to everyone. And really, if it's the winter and this is a summer home, the owner of the property probably isn't. The owner of an adjacent property probably isn't there either to see it. The, 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 the fun time is in the summer, and that's where everyone can go see it. Okay. So that's, that's kind of the easy part of this case. Um, just, just so you know, uh, the summer occupancy can be continuous possession um, so long as it's used in the manner in which the property was intended to be used. Okay? Good? All right. The trickier part, though, is tacking. Um, can someone please tell me what tacking is? Okay, okay redeem yourself. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's the adding of one's own personal personal uh, 
He added of one's own period of land possession to that of the prior possessor to establish the previous and first possession extension. All right, so what does that mean in English? In English, that means that if you own your land for two years, but the previous owner had it for, say, 10 years, they want to take your time, you want to take your time and add it to the previous possessor so that you satisfy whatever the statute says, says in that state. Okay. And is there any kind of special relationship that needs to exist between the first owner and the second owner? Yes, there has to be a privity. Thank you. There you go. Exactly. So, well, have you guys heard the word privity before in other law classes? Where? In what context? Good. Torts maybe you might have heard as well? Products liability? No. Privity of contract? Okay. What what does privity usually suggest? And a relationship between Exactly. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, you know, like privity of contract uh, privity of contract and torts means you can only sue the person who wrongs you. You can't sue some sort of derivative manufacturer. So if privity of contracts in effect you buy a GM a vehicle from the GM dealership, you can sue the dealership and not GM. That's been mostly abolished and replaced by a lot of product liability regimes in various states. But that's the general rule. So that's privity. So privity has to be person A, person B, for some sort of relationship. Obviously, if you have two adverse possessors, they can't hand over a deed unless they have a defective deed. They don't have deeds. It could just be an understanding. So say I'm on the land, and this guy comes by and says, hey, Josh, get off the land. You're a jerk, and he throws me off, and then he stays there. So I was there for five years. He throws me off, and then he stays for five years. Does he have title after five years? What do you say? No? Yes? Right there? Yep. Yeah. I would say no. Right. The problem isn't the changing of hands. The problem is the manner in which it was changed. It wasn't like a consensual at hands fair bargain. This was some jerk throwing off the land. And we'll get back to this in a minute, but the law doesn't look favorably on people who toss other people off the land. You have to have some sort of a, of a claim of right. Um, and this is something we talked about last time, but you have to have a legitimate claim. You can say, I want to be here. If you say, I want to be here in violation of the law, I want to toss Josh out, you don't have a claim of right, and the law will respect that. So let's go back to the Kunto case. So um, let's go down the row. So in the end, so did the Washington Supreme Court find that uh, Kunto, who had been there for one year, was in privity with the people who owned it before? Why did they find that? But. But we talked about a Monday mistake. Um, weren't they mistaken? Weren't the deeds in error? The deed said, I own this track, but it's really a different track? Yeah, okay, they were mistaken. D did that disqualify them from claiming adverse possession? <laughs> so is this a regime like the one New Jersey picked in the Manila case? Or is this like a... Uh, a regime under the main doctrine where intent matters. Does it? It's only two choices. So that's the other one. <laughs> Although I might trick you up once in a while and play devil advocate. Um, yeah. Oh, good. And I think I'm going to call on the person who messed up last time, so that should be perfect. This will be your revenge. Lenise Parker? Okay, so, okay, I'll try not to spill anything on this this time. So, um, the intent doesn't matter. So, did it matter that uh, Kunto was mistaken about the deed? No, did it, it, the mistake did not matter. Okay. And this is something of an anomalous adverse possession case. Usually, it's a case like what she had, what she had, where you think you own this much land, but you actually own part of it. Here, everything was totally wrong. No one was living on the right plot of land. 
um, at all. Everyone had totally messed this up. And uh, we talked a little bit in the last class about the importance of surveying, getting a survey done. And as our, uh, let's see, Andrea Roth said, surveys can often be in conflict. Here we had a survey done in, I think, the, the, the 50s, and it was totally wrong. Then you had another, another survey done by Howard that said, oh, wow, surprise, you have a lot more land than you thought you did. Um, surveyors might have various incentives, but surveys can be wrong. So even when you have a survey, you can be off. And I think this case illustrates how important adverse possession is. Um, you might not like it, but imagine what would have happened in this case if we didn't have adverse possession. Everyone would have been out of their house. Everyone on the entire block would have had to leave their house, all of them. They probably had those houses in their families for decades. And unless they actually like lift up the houses and move it 50 feet over, which you can't really do, they've all been in trouble. So this might be a case where adverse possession is a very, very, very good thing. Because the alternative would have been pretty damn harsh. Okay? All right. Any questions about the, this case? Sir? Let's see. Let's look at the names. Chase? Ben Slyke? D, uh, I think I think it was on, like at the map back up. You mean D? Yeah, that was theirs. Well, yeah. Well, you're assuming that there wasn't a neighbor. This map might be incomplete. I don't have the complete record, but let's just assume that a neighbor had a house on D, and he actually owned E. I think it is on this map, but let's just, for argument's sake, say, say there was a guy who lived on E, Smith, you know, and he had a house there. He would be in the exact same position as the Kuntos. I mean, perhaps, cozy and bargaining, the most easiest way to resolve this is to shift everyone over 50 feet. Like, I don't know if there's any mechanism to do that, but if equity had any say, you just shift everyone over, no harm, no foul. I don't know if you can do that. And unfortunately, this case went all the way up to the Intermediate Court of Washington, and they did one case at a time, only involving Howard and Kunto. But imagine there was E, F, G, H, you know, all the way down the shoreline. Everyone was off by 50 feet. Just kind of shift everyone over. Okay. Yes, sir? I if there was like maybe a bigger <laughs> plot of land. I don't know how big these plots were, but let's just say that you, someone did build their house and someone else's property. Um, would it be possible to maybe just carve out a piece of land that, that they were on and maybe, like, for example, like that back end of C, yeah. and maybe give that to? Yeah, I mean, now you're thinking like a chancellor sitting in equity. I mean, this would be an equitable solution. Um, this is why when we did that Jersey case with the sidewalk and 15 inches, the court said a lot about equity. They said, oh, well, you know, this might be a harsh result, but we can maybe carve a little bit here. Maybe you can just give the 15 inches. Um, that would probably be a more equitable result. I don't know how much law is supporting that. But I think you have a really bizarre case. And, you know, and keep in mind, this is a very, very posh area, so I'm guessing these are very wealthy people with very expensive lawyers arguing over this. So the resolution would have to be something that really appeals to all, all, of, these, uh, all of these guys. So ultimately, what's the, what's the ultimate holding? Let's see. Uh, Katie Johnson, what's the ultimate holding? What happens at the end? Who, 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 gets, who gets C? Who gets C? The Kuntos keep their land. Kunt exactly. Yep, so the Kuntos get their land. And like, um, let's see, Chase just said, uh, it's kind of perverse because now the Kuntos have C and D. And we're assuming that no one's living on D. Uh, the facts in here aren't totally complete. But let's say someone lived on D, then you have another adverse possession suit, and this just goes on for infinity. Okay. He got shafted. I mean, he he really got shafted. He gave his extra title to Moyer. Moyer gave him a title that's now worthless. So Moyer may have the best out of this. It looks like he really tried to like scam the witnesses. Like, like, why would he go to Moyer? To try to, I don't know. I, maybe I was confused. I thought he was trying to do something to do with anyway. He might have been. Um, he may, maybe he was. Maybe he was trying to play fast and loose. Uh, but he lost. <laughs> And uh, now, now he has this ugly property not even facing the water. So that that that's that, and and this picture is much prettier, but doesn't have nearly as much detail. So let's let's go from the uh, the warm weather of Puget Sound to the uh, 
the hot desert of Austin. And let's talk about the Texas code. Um, and let's talk about tacking in Texas. Okay. So the textbook gave you an example of a tacking statute. Um, can you see this? Okay, you can see this. Good. Uh, this is how Texas in, in the Texas code defines tacking. To satisfy a limitation period, peaceable and adverse possession does not need to continue in the same person, but there must be privity of a state between each holder and its successor. Um, I think that's pretty, that's pretty clear. All that means is if person A is adversely possessing something for a certain number of years, then he kind of hands it over to person B. Person B holds it for a number of years, then there's continuity, there's privity, and then you count it all together, you tack it like with a thumbtack, you just put it all together. Um, does that, that make sense? Okay. Uh, we're going to do a number of problems. These are in the book, but I think they're pretty good. So uh, let me put these up on the board. Turn to page 149. Uh, I'm sorry, 148 in your books. And I'll give you a, I'll give you a second. We're going to first do um, question one. Not much of a surprise there. Uh, and just take, take a minute to read it on page 148. All right, so question one, and these facts pertain to several sub-questions, so I'll just do the general facts first. O owns Black Acre, and I'm sure you're all much smarter than me. O stands for owner. I didn't realize that until maybe three weeks into law school, but O is owner, and H is heir. Like, I didn't realize it either until somewhat recently, so that will make these hypotheticals a lot easier. Uh, <laughs> little things that, 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 that makes up easier. Okay. O owns Blackacre. A enters in the year 2000, so he's a squatter. In 2007, you have some jerk, B, who tells A, scram, I'm taking over. Okay. A threatened. I'm um, sorry. So A is threatened, and he leaves. Then B enters in 2007. So uh, first question, is there privity between A and B? Now, this is like this jerk over here who threw me on my land, and he tossed me. There's no privity whatsoever. Okay. Let's do, let's do this first question. Okay. Can O eject B? All right. Let's, uh, let's start back over there. Yes. Can O eject B? Why? Well... Assume the statutory period is three years. Let's just assume it's three. Who has title then at that point? Are, are A and B in privity? Can B get anything from A because he got tossed out? No. Did, did A ever transfer any title to B? No. So... O would be able to. Okay. Let, let's try a slightly different one. Can O eject... Can A eject B? Well, the, the, the question was for 10, but I'm just changing it up a bit. If, if the period's 10 years, then O could eject B because... He had no one, no one's reached the period necessary for adverse possession. I just tweaked it a little bit for, for a separate hypothetical. If it was three years, then A would have had title. He would have gained adverse possession, in which case O would not have been able to, but A could have. So let's let's stick to ten years, okay? All right, let's stick to ten years. Could A eject B? Um, let's see. Tarlisha? Could A, how do you say it? Tarlisha. I will remember that. So can A eject B, assuming it's 10 years? Why? 
Yeah, and he had a claim of right. Even though, assuming it's a 10-year statute, he hadn't hit 10 years yet. He's only hit seven years. He still has a claim of right. So he could actually move to have uh, the interloper be ejected. Okay? All right, let's, let's take a look at paragraph number two. Uh, okay, that, that, that question right there. Take, take a minute to read it. Okay. So in this question, suppose that in 2007, A leaves under the threat of force. Okay, so he was there from 2000 to 2007, seven years. Six months later, A recovers possession from B. Say B runs away or whatever. Assuming O does nothing, he never re-enters, he never moves to eject anyone. When will A own Blackacre? So assuming he moved in January of 2000, and we have a 10-year statutory period. He got kicked off for six months, but then he came back. When will A own Blackacre? Let's see. Michelle, please. Mm -hmm. That's right. Well, well. Let me let, let, let me let, let me rephrase that. You are correct, but there's also alternative answers. So what do you think a different answer can be? So assuming he entered January 1st, 2000, your answer would be he could have title January 1st, 2010. What could the other option be? <laughs> Meaning... What are the what are the possible dates? So January first, twenty ten. That's one date. What's another possible date? Um, he got kicked out in two thousand seven. So I guess twenty seventeen. Right, but well, that's wrong. The the reason why is he didn't abandon it. The only reason why you start over from scratch is if you abandon it. If you vol if he voluntarily left in two thousand seven, he has to start from all over again. But the fact that he was kicked out means he doesn't start from scratch. So some courts say you wait exactly 10 years, meaning you don't hold against him the six months in which he was kicked out. No, it doesn't matter. If you're kicking someone out of their property, it doesn't matter who owns it. You're being forced to threaten off the land. He has a claim of right, and that's why that's such an important term. Even though he has no legal right, he has a claim of right. A has been there for seven years since adversely possessing it in the way the law permits. So we might think he's like Mr. Robinson, he's just some trespasser, but the law recognizes he has a certain right. Okay? Um, the other answer I was looking for, and I'll, I'll give it away, is July 1st, 2010. Other courts hold that you told the statute in the period in which he's not on the land. So if he's off the land for six months, you'd actually have to wait six more months. There's kind of a split of authorities on this. Some people say, well, he needs to have 10 years. 11, you know, nine years, six months is enough. You need 10 years. Other authorities say, why should he be penalized for that jerk who kicked him out? Why are we giving six free months to this, to this, this jerk, sir? How does that coincide with you? It's basically being told, you're right. Um, and in fact, there's no privity because he's been kicked out. So generally, this would be an exception. Uh, this this is probably more of an equitable doctrine where someone is off the land through no fault of his own, and they're going to toll the statute. Yeah, a student in the other class asked the exact same question. Um, probably the longer he's off, the, the weaker the case for equity becomes. Um, I think you're right. Uh, just, just a question from the chat came in. Um, uh, no, there will not be Texas law in the exam. I'm providing this purely for your own edification. Um, the stuff in the exam will be generic. Um, I might even, and I've decided, give you some other state you've never seen before, just kind of throw it up in the exam.
but you won't need to be responsible for the Texas code, although I think about 95% of you will probably take the Texas bar, so this will be helpful for you ultimately. And as far as the question about pizza, I think it's actually a student from my other class typing in this one, being a little jerk. Uh, <laughs> Slums of New York, I recognize the screen name. Someone had pizza before and they took it, I did not bring it in, so there's no cookies. So I, I apologize, but I assure you, I am not depriving you of any pizza. Uh, if you behave, maybe I'll bring it food at some other point. <laughs> All right, is that, is that good? Okay. So let's, uh, let's, let's go to question, okay, that's question two. Oh, um, and then by the way, do you guys know what the American Law Institute is? You ever hear of that? Do you know what the restatement is? Restatement of contract? Okay. There is this really big group of really smart lawyers and law professors who come together and make these books called restatements, which kind of just summarize the law. Uh, and they make this thing called the restatement of property, restatement of torts, restatement of everything. And, and their rule is that you have to wait 10 years and six months. They're going to make you su su uh, stick it out for another six months. Um, the minority rule is you wait 10 years even. Um, so there's kind of a split of authorities. Uh, but I think you, based on your discussion, I think you see the pros and cons of each. Let's do um, this question in the last paragraph. Take a minute to read it. This one should be easier because I think we already answered it. So uh, let's go Kevin Hardaway. Okay, I'll call you in a second. Okay, so, so in 2007, A abandons Blackacre. He's not kicked out, he abandons it. And then B goes into possession. Who owns Blackacre in 2010? Um, yeah. Why? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, there's no... Well, what's lacking? Perfect. There's no privity here. Okay. All right. Let's do these two questions, then we'll go on to disabilities. All right. Let, uh, read, read this one right here, number two. I'll come back in a minute. And I'm going to start with that row with uh, Kristen in a minute. Okay, so question two. I'll read it. Uh, a enters Blackacre in 1994. O owns it. In 1995, O dies. He leaves a will that divides Blackacre to B for life and the remainder to C. Try and remember from like four weeks ago when you had to know this. Uh, I won't come back to it often. In 2010, B dies without ha ever having entered Blackacre. So B never entered. And then the remainder went to C, which you should probably remember, but it went to C because it was it, B's dead. So who owns Blackacre? Person? Okay, take your time. No, 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 no. Well, it's kind of it's kind of a trick question, and you're not going to like the answer. But the adverse possession is not defeated by a subsequent conveyance. So even though the land was conveyed to um, to B, uh, I'm sorry, to B in 1995, the adverse possession started before it. So the conveyance isn't defeated by the fact that the adverse possession already started. Meaning. A's claim of adverse possession already began in 94 and was ticking upon B for all those years. So by the time, say it was a 10-year period, by the time 2004 rolled around, it was already A's. Even though it was conveyed anew, the interest is the same. So if you think about it, there's a taint, so to speak, on the interest. Even though O left it in his will to B, he didn't leave it all. If you think of a bundle of sticks, there was one stick missing. And the stick that was missing was the average possession. And the fact that B never entered during his life means he's out of luck. Now, uh, Andrea Roth, what, uh, what could C have done to maybe fix this problem? Because, you know, she just got this black acre that's absolutely worthless because she doesn't own it. What could she have done during the life of B? 
to uh, maybe take something up. Yeah, so assume it's 2009, B's on his deathbed, and you know, C's like, dude, do something at this line. It's like, I can't enter, I'm tired, I can't get to bed. So what, what, could, what, could, what could C have done, assuming he was you know, 2009 or 2008? She could have. Or she could have used her future interest to perhaps file some sort of action against B saying, uh, uh, eject this interloper, eject this squatter. I mean, she had a future interest in the land. I think she probably had some standing to eject the squatter. No? I'm sorry, 2004. I can't count. Assuming, assuming the tenure hadn't run. I'm going to make a lot of math mistakes today. I'm sorry. I made a really bad one in the last class where I, I subtracted 10. I should have added. So catch me. Oh, good timing. I'm looking for research assistants. Um, uh, if anyone's interested, uh, it's tougher enough for night students, but it's, it's qualified for federal work study. Uh, send me a resume, um, and I will be happy to take a look at it because I'm bad at math and stuff like that. Okay, back, back to back to law. So that that's question two. Um, it's not a very satisfying answer, uh, but that's how it works. I'm going to skip three because that goes even deeper into wills and laws, and I really don't want to do trust and states because that's something that should really be done in a different class, and I don't want to confuse too much. Okay, so. Pizza, pizza, pizza. All right, so let's talk about disabilities. Remember Little Caesar? Do they still have that here? Pizza, pizza? A little. Yeah. Is it? You ever see the? Uh, you ever see those Papa John's commercials like Better Pizza, Better Ingredients, Papa John's? There was actually a lawsuit between Domino's and Papa John's, where uh, Domino's actually won a court order saying that Papa John's was just puffery. Remember that word? Puffery just means you're full of it. It, it, it means you're last say we have the best, even though no one means it. And actually, Domino's had this commercial that was standing for the Fifth Circuit Courthouse in New Orleans, saying right for the courthouse, holding up the court order, where it's like, this is pure puffery. <laughs> and they like a legal definition saying that Papa John's isn't better. So, law of pizza, it's there. They're allowed to use it, but it's puffery. It's not actually any actual factual statement. It's just meant to be some sort of just braggadocio. Okay, so let's talk about disabilities, okay? And I'm going to go back to the Texas Code. Um, but yeah. I'm not going to test on anything in the Texas Code. I'm including a purely for your own benefit. Um, so don't feel obliged to remember it, though on the bar it might become useful for you to have some inkling of how this stuff works. Um, on the exam, I'll, I'll either expect you to just know the general stuff in the book, or I might give you a statutory code from some state, might be Texas, might not be, and you'll have it with you to work, to work on. Okay? So, what is a disability in the context of uh, adverse possession law? Let's see. Andrew Riley, what is, what, what is a disability in the context of adverse possession? Why, 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 do, why do we have that? Well, let, let's look at the statute. In Texas, there are two categories of people who are disabled, actually only two. One, if you're under 18, so you're a child, you haven't reached age majority. And two, if you're of unsound mind. I won't go into what text defines as being insane or unsound mind. That, that's for another class. But um, unsound mind. Um, why, in the context of adverse possession, would these people get this kind of benefit? Why, why would they not be responsible for knowing about someone being on their land? Well, think about it. What's the what, what's one of the requirements of uh, adverse possession? Well, not notice, but what's what's the biggie? Biggie Smalls. Notorious. Good. You have to be open and notorious. The law presumes that these people are not smart enough to see someone on their land. We talked about whether you have adequate notice that someone's on your land. If someone is, you know, mentally handicapped, they're not going to be able to discern that someone's on their land. Or if you have a child who's five years old, we can't really expect them to do a survey of the land and see who's on it. So this works because the law recognizes these people as being unable to represent their own interests. So if someone's on their land adversely possessing it, it can't be held against them as a defense. 
Now, if someone raised this in the other class, which I didn't really think about, who's not on this list? Elderly? What other kind of people might have a hard time seeing if someone's on their land? Prisoners. Yes, and apparently Texas somewhat recently removed them from this list. Uh, I, haven't, I haven't done much research on this, but, uh, and this is what Sudan said, but um, at some point in a lot of states, people in prison are on this list, that people in prison are presumed not to know what's going on in their land. But this is effective in 1985, so this is actually pretty, uh, pretty recent, not, not, not too recent. Yeah, do you answer? Okay. So let's walk down the statute. All right, so this part's easy. You probably remember this from contracts. If you're a minor, if you understand mine, you can't make a contract. That's easy enough. B, if a person entitled to bring an action is under a legal disability when the cause of action accrues, the time of the disability is not included in the limitation period. So limitation, statute of limitation, that's where this kind of connects. So if I'm O and I'm only two years old, I own a plot of land, and you're sitting on my land for 10 years, tough cookies. There's no adverse possession because I'm only two years old. And even at the end of the period, I'm only 12. Okay? That is a defense you raise if someone has a claim of adverse possession. So part C, remember this, because I'll ask you a question in like five minutes and it will rely on this one. Just remember it. A person may not tack one legal disability to another to extend a limitations period. Say O is mentally handicapped, and then he, then he leaves the land in his will to his son who's a minor. The only disability that matters is the original one, the handicap. You can't tack one to another to another. Imagine a situation where someone sets up this scheme where they keep leaving it to a younger child and a younger child. You can effectively defeat adverse possession forever. You only get one bite at the apple. Um, in some states, you have it, you take the one that benefits the owner. So if one disability is longer than the other, you take the longer one. That varies by state. But generally speaking, you only have one disability. Okay. This one's important because this was probably one of the more common ones. D, a disability that arises after limitation period starts does not suspend the running of the period. So say I'm O, I own my land. A comes up my land and starts squatting. One year later, I get into a really bad car accident and I lose mental uh, capabilities. Ten years elapses. Who owns the land? Right. Because he squatted before I had the handicap. Flip it around. Say I'm already mentally handicapped and the squatter comes the next day. He waits ten years. Does he get the land? So it's very important when the disability happens, because that's when you can start clicking and start counting. Okay. All right. Any questions about that Texas statute? All right. Let's do let's do some problems in your book, page one forty nine, please. And uh, there's a number of pretty pretty good questions that I think flesh this topic out well. Okay. And we'll start with question one. And we'll, we'll start in a minute with, uh, let's see, one, two, three. Mark Salazar. Okay, one minute. I'll, I'll read the question, but we'll come to you in a minute. We'll go down that row. Take your time to look over the question. Okay. All right, so... These three facts apply to everything. So, okay, so O is the owner in 1984. A adversely enters in 1984. And we'll assume, as is everywhere, the age majority is 18. Okay? All right, so the first question O was already insane in 1984. O dies insane, it's a very painful way of dying, but he dies insane and intestate in 2007, so he has no will. So O is insane from 1984 through 2007, okay? Assuming that there's no error, let's just do the first question first. Would uh, the squatter A have any claim in 2007, assuming he had no heirs? Yeah. 
he, right, A entered in 1984 and assumed that B is insane for the entire period on which A is squatting, and then, I'm sorry, O is insane for the entire period in which A is squatting, then O dies of any heirs. Could, could A claim title at that point? Why do you say that? What's the word? Disability? Yeah. So the entire time in which A was squatting, O was under a disability. Okay. So, um, let's see. Miguel Salazar? Are these two Salazars next to each other? Okay. <laughs> what did you say? Okay. Ah, nah, whatever. So, uh, oh, people always find my last name Blackman, like the Justice, M U N, so. Oh, man. So, O's heir. Okay, so let's look at let's look at uh, letter A. O's heir H is under no disability in two thousand seven. Okay. When can would when would A get title for the land in this case? Good. Exactly. Why? Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Let's see. James Helton. All right. Let's look at let's look at letter B. Okay. Sure. Sure. I think we'll do that like another two questions, okay. and I'll call on you for that one. So I'll skip you now. Okay. So let's see. Eric Bourne. Okay. Let's do let's do letter B. So O's air H is only. Oh, this was a question you were asking. Okay, now I'm back, back to you. <laughs> that was fun. Yeah. Okay, so O's heir, H, is six years old in 27. It's, it's six years old in 2007. So when, assuming there's no action for ejection, when would A take title? Let's go back to the Texas statute, okay? What's. Remember the one I told you to remember because I'll ask you a question about it? So, what was that one say? O is disabled because he's mentally handicapped. H is disabled because he's a minor. You just added those two together. Uh, hold on, let's go back to the question. No, 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 this, this changed it up. O is insane in 1984. And dies insane in two thousand seven. So with those with those facts, so O is insane in nineteen eighty four. Dies insane in two thousand seven. His heir is only six in two thousand seven. Assuming that there's no action for ejection, when can A take title? No. Well, Eric. It's the same answer as what Miguel said a minute ago. The answer is exactly the same. You can't, let's go back to the Texas statute for a second, you can't tack one disability to another. You have already had, from 1984 to 2007, was told, or told is the wrong word, but it doesn't count because it was a disability. The fact that a minor got it afterwards doesn't matter. You start counting once it's transferred. So you can't tack disability upon disability upon disability. Okay? But he was possessing it under a disability, meaning the 23 years in which he was possessing it while O was in charge didn't count. So even though he was there, if, if O wasn't insane, he would have had it by 1994. But he was insane. And because he was insane, his first shot at getting average possession was not until 2007 when O died. So he, he would need to wait till 2017 for it to happen, irrespective of how old the errors. Okay. All right. Does that question make sense? Yes? Okay. All right. Let's do, um, let's do question number two. Okay. And it, uh, uh, James, let's do this one again because I think this might clarify things for you a bit. I'll call you this one again. So O has no disability in 1984. This is a hypothetical I just gave. O dies and tested in 2002. 
Bozair H is only two years old in 2002. So H was born in 2000. At what point would the clock start ticking? Ah, you walked into it. Bo had no disability in 1984. When, when did he get it? This is a run-of-the-mill average possession. 94. Okay. Okay, good. All right, everyone see that? You shaking your head now? Sure. Bo has no disability. He's fine. So from 1984 to 1994, we're running average possession like normal. When 1994 hits, A's got it. It doesn't matter that O left in his will for H because the conveyance doesn't defeat average possession. Yeah, I'm I'm working I'm working with a ten year one, but okay, you, I have to make sure that the yeah. Ten years are specific no, it's it, yeah. I mean, if you want to do twenty one, you can do you can make it two thousand five. I'm just running with ten years, so the numbers work in either event. Okay, so let's do let's do question number three. Uh, let's start with um, that row. Anthony Sten Sencliffe. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's I'll read it read it for a minute. I'll, I'll come to it in a second. Okay, so question three. O was five years old in 1984, and then so I get my math right. That means he was born in 1979, right? Yeah. Okay, good. So O was born in 79. In 1994, O becomes mentally ill, and O dies and tested in 2009. O's heir, H, is under no disability. Does the average possess, when does, okay, so let's, let's look at it this way. When did the clock start ticking against A, the squatter? How old does O have to be before the clock starts ticking? Okay, and when did O turn 18? Is that right, math? 97, okay, good. So O reached the age of majority, majority in 1997. When does the clock start ticking? Okay. O dies and tested in 2002. Um, I'm sorry, I read the wrong question. Okay, so O dies in 2009. In 2009, how many years had ticked away? Okay. At that point, who owned it? At what point did he own it? Good. Exactly. That's exactly right. He owned it already by 2007, so in 2009 when he died and left it to his heir, it didn't matter. He didn't have it anymore. So you have to start counting when the guy turns 18. Okay? Does that make sense? Question three? Yeah. Did I... Right, right. No, no, you, you could, no, you're right. You could use the one that's more beneficial. I think this one, you get more time out of it. Because here, you start counting in 1997. There would be, so I guess it's 13 years versus 15 years. Yeah, you can read it either way. Um, no, you're right. The, the, the first, so some jurisdictions will base on whichever one's longer. So if you base on which one's longer, I think you buy more time with the disability. If you kind of base on the fact that, well, you can't tack, you take the first one around, you have to base on the age. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, and in fact, if you give me either answer, I'd probably give you credit. Because either answer is, is very astute. So assuming that we're basing it first on the age, 
So we're not tacking, we're just assuming his, his initial disability is age. He turns 18 in 1997. He started taking 10 years from 1997 to 2007. Let's look at the other way. Assuming we use it from 1994, he's disabled from 1994 until 2009. In which case, we start counting in 2009, and that'll go to 2019. Right? Um, yes, you're right. You're correct. The, I'm sorry. The reason why that won't work is because the disability accrued after the squatting began. Thank you very much. That, that is absolutely correct. Okay. The, re the reason why that won't work is you can, let's go back to the Texas statute. The reason why that won't work is the disability only counts after a limitation period starts. If we started squatting in, 2000, uh, in 1984, at that point, O was already a minor. So that's okay. The disability came a decade later. And that, that, that doesn't count because it occurred afterwards. But assuming that that, that wasn't an issue, some jurisdictions let you use a longer one. Some jurisdictions take the first in time. Um, on the exam, give me either answer, I'll be happy. If you give me both answers, I'll be even happier. That, that, that's a good exam answer. If you give me both things, you tell me why one's better than the other. Let's see if I get your name. Uh, Jamie? Okay. So just to be clear on the tacking, you can't tack on disabilities if they occur in two separate people, but you can tack them on if they occur in the same individual. Uh, like in this case, he's a minor. And then he became disabled. Well, I suppose if, if we, I don't think he could. I'm not exactly sure about that. that that's, that's, a, that's a tricky one. I'm guessing no. And I'm trying to think of a situation where that would happen. Let's say, let's say there's a minor. I'm five years old, and someone starts squatting tomorrow. Then I become disabled. The fact that disability happened afterwards means it wouldn't count. Let's say I'm a minor, and I'm disabled. And then someone starts squatting. The... Disability would run as long as I'm mentally disabled, I suppose, even though I was a minor first. I think that's probably how it would have to work. Yeah, I think I think I think you hit it right on the head. The fact that it's based on when it's a, when the accrual happens rules out most kind of creative tackings. Okay, I saw a question in the back row somewhere. Same. Any other? Okay. All right. Does that make sense? Okay, one last question on unpacking, and then we'll, we'll move on. Okay. So, O disappears. I'm sorry, one last question, disability. O disappears in 1997. Never heard from again. All right, you guys are going to be lawyers in a couple of years. You represent A. A wants to buy Black Acre from, I'm sorry, B wants to buy Black Acre from A. What do you tell your client? Okay. Any other thoughts? Well, what are the possible risks? Let's look at it that way. What are the possible risks here? Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's look at a couple of possible mistakes. One, maybe O has an heir, and the heir has a title to it. What if O, the reason why he ran away, was because he was mentally handicapped? And it turns out that he had been adversely possessed under a disability. He'd be out of luck. What if it turns out that, um, that, there was, that, that O was a minor during this time? So I think the right answer is you get some good title insurance. And you get, a, uh, you get some sort of broker to, to put his skin on this. Okay? All right. I think that that's all we're going to do for disability. Uh, we'll move on to the next topic. Uh, not too much time. This adverse possession against the government. Um, here's just a random story from the New York Times uh, from a couple years ago. This was a guy in actually somewhere in Queens who um, discovered a plot of land the city owned that was never used. And he had the genius idea of putting a garbage dump chop shop and a uh, parking lot on top of this government plot of land. And he kept it there for almost 20 years. And he actually claimed title by adverse possession, which is kind of uh, crazy. The city wasn't too happy about it. Now, in many jurisdictions, you can't claim adverse possession against the, uh, the government. New York allows it, but with a certain caveat, you can't claim public land that's using for public use. This land in particular had been meant to be a park or some sort of urban renewal, something or other. So New York 
first of all files a motion to eject him as a trespasser, <laughs> and then they hit him again even harder, saying that you are violating environmental regulations by dumping on this land. So this guy got in a lot of trouble. So in New York, you know, don't do anything bad because they will find you. Uh, I realize we don't have too many New Yorkers here, but just don't do anything stupid in New York because you will get caught and you will go to jail. I, I, don't, I tried actually looking up what happened to this guy. I couldn't find it. I'm pretty sure he got a serious fine for environmental regulations. He dumped in, a, in somewhere in Queens, some wetland or something. So um, there's oh, one other thing. A Rockefeller Center, 30 Rock in New York, you guys know about it, where the big tree is? One day a year, they actually shut down the plaza in front of it to, to kill any average possession claims. They actually shut down the sidewalk one day a year to make sure no one's just sleeping there. Because it's actually quite feasible in New York to sleep on a sidewalk for, for you know, 10 years straight. Uh, and, and it's actually, they're bushes and stuff. I mean, it, it's feasible. Um, so they actually shut down Rockefeller Center one day a year. This is New York. Okay, back to Texas. Um, so that is, that is all you have to know about disabilities. Okay, let's, let's turn to uh, chattels. Who remembers what a chattel is? Oh, come on. You know, you know what that word? Yeah. I think the fact that New York makes uh, that the, uh, I think actually Columbia University owns the land under Rockefeller Center. I'm not sure about that. I think the fact that they make such a big deal about shutting down one day a year and kicking everyone off will be pretty good evidence to report that this guy's a conner and was trying to just be a shuckster and try to trick them. That, that's why they make such a big deal about it because this, it is such a pop, popular, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know the history. I tried looking this up. I'm guessing that someone tried doing this once and they learned a lesson and they said, okay, from now on one day we we'll shut this down. That's probably how this started. Uh, yeah, um, it's kind of perverse that the, that the government can adverse possess, adverse possess your land, you can't adverse possess their land. And there's a lot of asymmetries between what government can do with property and what you can. We'll talk about that with zoning and takings in a couple, couple months or so. All right. uh, before I move on to George O'Keefe, any other questions about this? Okay. Any art fans here? Anyone like art? No. Yeah? Anyone like Georgia O'Keeffe? Uh, anyone know anything about her? She what? Flowers. That's one way to look at it. Uh, uh, I don't particularly care for art. This is her. Um, she was really old. She lives to be 99. I was actually kind of, kind of confused when I first saw this case was in Jersey in 1980. I was thinking, how is she still alive? But she was probably 90, 95 when that happened. It was towards the end of her life. Um, I got some pictures of the actual paintings of the, uh, no, not that. Um, so yeah, they look like flowers. But this is one of her things called cliffs. Uh, yeah. And, uh, uh, yeah. And, and seaweed. So these are the paintings that were at issue in this case. Um, before I jump into it, has anyone seen Thomas Crown Affair? The movie? Wasn't that a good movie? Okay, this is not that. This movie, this is a really crappy art heist. It's just not interesting at all. Uh, but go see Thomas Crown It's a very, very good movie. So uh, let's let's do O'Keefe Snyder. And I'm just going to write OK because I, I never spell her name right because there's too many E's and F's. Okay, so O'Keefe Snyder. Oh, before I start, uh, Replevin. Does anyone know what that is? Let's go down the row. Where was I? Uh, back row. What's your plevin? Uh, uh, Catherine Sheffer.
Does anyone remember where you might have seen that word before? It was in a contracts case. It involved a cow. Sherwood v. Walker, replevin for a cow. Remember with a mutual mistake, Rose II of Abilene with the milk? Remember? That case was seared in my memory for whatever reason. The first sentence was replevin for a cow. That was like the first sentence. Uh, I don't know why. Um, yeah, anyway, unimportant. So replevin. Replevin is a action at common law or by statute now to recover loss or stolen property. Okay, so this case is something of a of a of a beast, and I'm going to walk you through the facts. So the timeline is really uh, is, is really quite complicated because it's happened over almost 40 years. Okay, so Georgia O'Keeffe, she's this big shot artist. She has this gallery with a bunch of uh, other artists in the city. Uh, in the 1940s, or some rumors and paintings are stolen. In any event, in 1946, or so she recalls, there were three pictures missing from the gallery. Okay? Then from 1946 to 1972, what does Miss O'Keefe do? Uh, Anna Rose, Sorcy. From like 1946 to 1972, it's like, she doesn't do a damn thing. Yeah. What does she do then in 19, uh, I'm sorry, 1972, I meant. What did she do in 1972 after 30 something years? Yeah, yeah, there was this thing called the um, Art Dealers Association of America, that's some sort of bulletin or report where they listed all stolen artwork. And the thinking behind this is if something's listed in here and you're an art dealer, an art buyer, you know not to buy it because it's hot. I mean, think of life before the internet, it's hard to think of it. This was actually a, a somewhat effective mechanism to find lost or stolen art. Okay, so we're talking 1946 to 1972, so it's 26 years, yeah? That's a long time, and that's the first time anything is actually done about this. So she lists this stolen in 1972. All right, just Loki? Loki. Okay, what happens then in 19, uh, 1975? Okay, and by 1975, where were the paintings? By 1975, where were the paintings? Who? His name's in the case. Snyder. Good. And where was his gallery? See Newark? No, no, not quite that good. Jersey! Come on. <laughs> no, they're not the same. They're not the same. If you'll get into a duel with a New York to say it's from Jersey, it's a really big. There's a Hudson River, so there's, there's there's New York, the Hudson River, and Jersey. And actually, you might I don't even know this. The um the Statue of Liberty in Ellis Island, um, is the Statue of Liberty part of New York and New Jersey? Why? Why? Because it's closer. The Statue of Liberty, the Statue of Liberty is actually closer to New Jersey than it is to New York. There's actually a Supreme Court case. I think it was New York versus New Jersey. The last ten or fifteen years, they actually resolved that and gave the Statue of Liberty to freaking Jersey. <laughs> it's looking a little more bronze recently, but uh, I think uh, I, I think I think they'll move on from that. Okay, so the paintings found in Jersey, O'Keefe demands its return. And then Snyder, who's confronted with this world-famous artist who's probably 80-something years old, demanding a lost painting, what does he say? <laughs> yeah, he says, no. He says, screw you. I mean, this is like a world-famous artist. She's probably in her, you know, she's 80-something years old. And he says, no, I'm not giving it back to you. Now, where did Snyder get it from? Let's see. Amy? Where, where did Snyder get the painting from? You're, there's one other person involved. Frank. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> Snyder got it from Frank. Where did Frank get it from? His dad. Exactly what you said. 
when does Frank first remember seeing the painting? Uh, halt. Exactly. So O'Keefe says, I lost these paintings in 1946. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Okay, so Civ Pro guys, what's the standard for summary judgment? GIMF, G-I-M-F, right? Is there a genuine issue of material fact here? Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that a really big deal when the paper, when the thing was stolen? Isn't this a reason not to grant summary judgment? Okay. So the New Jersey Supreme Court recognized this, and they said that there's some genuine issue of material fact, right? And that was the end of the case, right? No. I mean, I made you read like nine other pages of stuff beyond what actually needed to happen. Let's see. Uh, G Jiho? So, what happened here? If, <laughs> if there was a genuine issue of material fact, why did the court ramble on for like nine more pages and there's more that the book cut out? Was that really necessary to the case? No. Uh, let's, let's go to um, row. Uh, okay, row over there. Okay, we got John. So, have you guys studied the concept like holding and dicta? Have you seen that in other classes? So, generally, and there's a lot of definitions, but generally, holding is what the court actually holds. So, the holding here probably should have been something simple, like. There's a genuine issue of material fact that when this painting was stolen, remand, hold the trial, let the jury figure that out. But what about all this other stuff about adverse possession? Was any of that actually necessary to the case? Yeah, you'll see, you'll see this a lot in appellate courts. And if I may draw one instance from current events, the Chief Justice's opinion in the healthcare case. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but you might know that the Chief Justice voted to say that the Affordable Care Act was a tax, which is fine. But then he spent 30 pages talking about why, if it wasn't a tax, it would violate the Commerce Clause. So why did the Chief Justice need to spend 30 pages talking about something that was totally irrelevant to his opinion? And that, what? Well, that's one interpretation. Please. Well, I was just saying, maybe the next time that issue. So, so in federal courts, something called a case or controversy. Have you heard of those? That like courts supposed to resolve the case before them, not some other cases not before them. That's generally a principle of appellate rule that you only resolve the case before you and the record before you. Uh, what the New Jersey Supreme Court did here was kind of crazy, and I only want to pause on it to realize how crazy it was because it made you suffer that you read all these pages of something that didn't even matter. That they. They said all these things by creating registries and, and you know all these other recommendations that were totally irrelevant to the case before. Uh, when I clerk, the judge would always take out the stuff whenever I tried doing it. I would say, Judge, we need to tell the lower courts how to do their job. And he's like, No, they'll they'll do it themselves. You only do what you need to do. Some some judges like doing this, but just keep an eye on them. Uh, this is the same New Jersey Supreme Court that dumped the in the Manila case a couple uh, about fifteen years earlier had dumped the doctrine of uh, forgiveness of mistaken intent. They dumped the doctrine the court adopted for 30 years. And this is the same New Jersey Supreme Court that decided the Mount Laurel case we'll study later, which totally redefined zoning and racial, uh, uh, racial zoning laws. Really big case. So this is something of, a, something of a, an aggressive, uh, engaged court. But let's, let's kind of look through what the court actually did. Um, so O'Keefe didn't find out about the stolen painting until about 1975 or 1976. The statute of limitations for replevin is, is six years, right? So, uh, Dan Khan, how the heck could Georgia O'Keeffe possibly claim that she found it within six years? Mm -hmm. 
Okay. So you say the statute of limitation tolls. Um, what did the Jersey Supreme Court actually do, though? Did they apply a straight up adverse possession? Uh, Kieran? Okay, so what's this discovery rule? Is this, is this usual what we do in adverse possession? No, this is something different. All right, let's see. I think I skipped over you when I jumped the rule. So, Brittany, Mitchell, so what is a discovery rule? How, do, how does it work? Right. So, so, so roughly speaking, the discovery rule is when a person knew or should have known that this painting was stolen. Uh, let's see. Niles? How can we expect someone to know if a painting has been stolen? Um, you know, if someone's sitting on a piece of land, presumably we can see them there. You know, Mr. Robinson's on TV. We can see him, you know, walking around the house, chilling. But this painting was sitting in someone's study for three decades. What, what, what standard can we use to assess whether um, this has actually been taken? Mm -hmm. So how would, yeah. So how would standards of being open and notorious work when you're talking about a, a chattel, a piece of like personal property? Okay. okay. Daniel? Okay, so assuming that the discovery rule applies, do you think that Miss O'Keefe actually was diligent in recovering it? No. <laughs> Why not? Exactly. Okay. Uh, Chase, what do you think? Yeah. Anybody want to defend Miss O'Keefe? And maybe let's substitute some world famous artist, some starving artist who, you know, had a studio broken into. Anyone feel more uh, empty for that? Let's go to uh, uh, Melissa. You want to make an argument in favor of this kind of discovery rule where you, where you put a lot of uh, faith in when a person is actually looking for it. Okay, let's put this way. Yep. Go for it. Well, I, th I, th I think, I think, what do you mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
yeah, maybe, maybe this is kind of an, as an objective standard. We look to, you know, maybe there's some way to check different art galleries in the area. I mean, uh, I suppose what defeats all this is if it's in some guy's private study, then you're never going to find it. Um, did you, Katie, your hand was up? Yeah. Adrian? Right, you have to you have to have been able to locate it. Yeah. Yeah. And the issue of whether it was stolen or missing is a huge issue of fact that could have been resolved. I think there was something in the record that her, her wannabe lover oh, sorry, so was terrible. Uh, might have been relatives to Frank. And um, there might have been something there. Uh, before we run out of time, I'll let you a little bit early. Who has a burden here, though? This isn't totally a blessing for Mrs. O'Keefe. Who keeps a burden? She does. Generally, under average possession, who has a burden? The squatter or the owner? He who has a burden. Owner. Good. Okay. All right. All right. Any questions? Nope. All right. Enjoy your weekend. <laughs>